Welcome to the Modern Disease Lecture, which was rescheduled from February 5th. And I'm delighted that we can do it for you, because I think it's a very important topic in Dutchess County. <laughs> By the way, yes? Paul. Mid Hudson Valley comes up to right? Good. Anyway, my name is Mom Two. I can't pick my parents, so I'm stuck with this name. <laughs> I came from Burma initially. So two. You found one two. My name. And I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Vassar Brothers Institute. I don't know, for those of you who may not, can you hear me in the back? All right. For those of you who may not be familiar with Vassar Brothers Institute, it was founded in 1882 by the nephews of Matthew Vassa, who founded Vassa College. So they're Guy Vassa, Matthew Vassa Jr. was founded in 1882 to promote knowledge of science, literature, and art in the community. And this is part of the legacy. They love some endowment funds. By the way, we also have, as a Brothers Institute, have travel out programs in Poughkeepsie High School from November to March. On the way out, take a look at the program. For 10, I love 10 travel out lectures. You can join us for $35, two people. It was subsidizing 60% folks. The uh, I also want to at this time thank Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union for sponsoring part of these lecture expenses for the fifth year in a row. Joe, are you around today? Joe Alpert, Joe is not here. I also want to. Joe! There you are. I didn't see him. I'm too Okay, he was trustee of Brother Brothers Institute. He's first vice chairman of no federal savings bank. Ready. Okay. Ready. <laughs> That's Ready. a valley federal saving bank. Uh, I also want to thank Jill Alba. I don't know anyone in the county of Mid Hudson Valley who did for Lyme disease detection, prevention, cure very aggressively than well. That means someone, but I know you, so please stand up and recognize. Jill Alba. Where's Ira? I didn't go. Ira? Where'd you go? You'll be recognized. Okay. <laughs> All right. I also want to recognize today John Farrell of Protection Journalist here. And we're also honored to have Senator Terry Gibson's. Deputy Chief of Staff, and stand up. He handed me that he is sponsoring uh, the alleged public issue and other tick-borne diseases pathogens. Here are the bills he has introduced. Okay, S3478, S Tick Bike Act, Doctor Potential Bill and Tick Red Act, Tick Bite Act. 
So support that legislation by talking to your legislator or writing to them, okay? Because April 1st is coming right now. The other thing, I, you know, when you're a brand new organization, you worry about money. <laughs> We're broke. <laughs> we subsidize 60. So, on the way out, empty your pockets. <laughs> In any address, and visit our table, by the way, we need money badly. So consider a little, you know, even we take pennies if we want them. Fine. A hundred dollar bill. Or if you don't have it, take a little brochure and mail it in. I really would appreciate that. Now, before I... Introduce this. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I want to point out the exits in the back, on the side, and uh, Dr. Fallon, this is second time. He came in 2009, and I asked him last year, would you like to come? He says, I'm not ready yet. So I'll come when I have something to say. See, I run the science of life, to me, it's important to give you something useful. That's our goal. And I think that I'd like to thank Dr. I want to say a few words about him. Dr. Brian Fowl directs the Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Disease Research Center and Center for Neuroinflammatory Disorders in Biobehavioral Medicine at New York State Psychiatric Institute. He's currently launching a protect prospective study of Lyme disease to evaluate a new diagnostic assay to determine the biomarkers of recovery and chronicity. We're concerned with recovery and chronicity. So he received BA at a medium Harvard University an MPH in epidemiology MD from Columbia University. So please join me <coughs> in giving a resounding Poughkeepsie Midhatton Valley applause. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Tu. Thank you, Vassar Brothers Institute, and um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, it disturbs me to see so many people here. <laughs> no, it really does, because um, it reminds me of when I came to uh, this Poughkeepsie area about three or four years ago when I was doing a screening clinic for Lyme disease, and I had planned to run these clinics one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and I expected we'd have may maybe 10 or 15 people showing up for blood tests. And we ended up having 100 people showing up at each time. We could hardly draw all the blood of all those people. And, and they waited online for hours, so it was terrible. I want to have the lecture first and question and answers at the end. So anyway, I am aware of how much this disease affects you as a community, and I hope that um, I hope uh, tonight's talk gives you a better feeling about what current science is leading us towards in our understanding of Lyme disease. and gives you a sense of hope that even though we may not have all the answers now, there are answers emerging, and people are now, I think, on a much better track in studying this disease than they had been in a while. So some of the slides will be technical. I like to tell stories, so I'll try to tell it in a story format. Um, but I'm going to show you the science as well. So that is what the tick looks like up close. And, you know, I tell people, you know, if you, if you think you're walking through a beautiful leaf litter and you love walking through a leaf litter, well, just think about those guys hanging out in the leaf litter. 
So here's a doctor saying to the patient, the bad news is you have Lyme disease, the good news is I don't believe in that disease, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, un un unfortunately, this is often the case with, with patients going to see the doctor where they uh, think they may have Lyme disease, and the doctor says, well, yeah, maybe you do, but I don't treat that, and so I, I really can't help you. So. If it's early, if it's obvious, they will treat, and oftentimes after that, uh, doctors can be perplexed as to what to do next. So I like to show this. This is uh, from an illustration by William Blake from the Book of Job. And if you recall from the Book of Job, Job was tormented by, um, really, by God telling him, uh, temp uh, challenging him by giving him all these brutal wounds all over his body and sores and killing off his family and killing off his livestock and burning down his buildings and trying to see if he would be faithful to God. And, and meanwhile, the neighbors are saying, you know, Job, you really must have done something wrong. That's why you're so sick. There's something, you know, you're probably making it up or you sinned or you did something wrong. So oftentimes when people have chronic illness or when they have uh, symptoms that persist and you don't know why, it's, it's very tempting for family members to say you're making it up or uh, doctors to say, look, I don't have a blood test that can tell me why you're sick the way you're sick, and so maybe there's something other wrong with you, and I don't understand that. So it's very difficult. Now, if you're lucky, you'll come in with a beautiful bullseye rash, or you'll come in with a cranial nerve palsy, a facial nerve palsy, or Lyme arthritis, a swollen knee. That's if you're lucky. Uh, because if you come in with that, and you live in a place like this, of course the doctor is going to think of Lyme disease and test you for Lyme disease. Uh, but how often um, are there other manifestations of Lyme disease that don't appear like this? Well, you know, Alan Steer actually did a study and he published it in the New England Journal of Medicine and showed that about 20% of the time, the first manifestation is flu-like symptoms. And they don't present with a rash, they don't <coughs> present with a swollen joint, they don't present with a cranial nerve palsy. And how many doctors are aware that the initial manifestation might be flu-like symptoms? Certainly any doctor who works closely with these patients in a Lyme endemic area would be aware. But I'm worried that doctors who don't work in heavily Lyme endemic areas like this wouldn't be aware. And so those patients would not get treated, tested for Lyme disease, they would not get treated with antibiotics, and then they would end up with a more difficult illness. So here comes uh, some of the science. What have the recent studies taught us? So the bad news is that Lyme disease incidence is much higher than had been previously widely recognized. And, and finally, this past August, the CDC revised their estimate. And the estimate that was listed in each year, they, they have their surveillance criteria, and it's roughly about 25,000 to 26,000 new cases of Lyme disease each year. They knew that that was an underestimate because a lot of doctors don't report new cases. Um, but it wasn't entirely clear what that underestimate was until they did a series of studies which they reported last August, in which now they recognize and, and state that over 300,000 Americans are diagnosed with Lyme disease each year. And the geographic uh, it's, uh, spread is expanding, so it's in a lot more places than it used to be. So what's the good news about these rising numbers? Well, the good news is that when you have such a big problem, the media starts to pay more attention to it. The NIH starts to pay more attention to it. The government start, starts to filter more funds to the disease. So I think the good news, and even private industry starts to think, well, here's a chance. I'm going to start making money if I make a better diagnostic test that's going to be better than the ones that exist. So it's a good motivational force to have more cases of Lyme disease. So we don't want more cases of Lyme disease, but there's always a positive sometimes to the negative. Uh, well, this is cut off a little bit, but a Lyme rash, the typical bullseye rash, looks like this. But most of the Lyme rashes actually are not bullseye rashes. This is actually something that looks a lot like a spider bite, but this turns out to be a Lyme rash. And you wouldn't recognize this as a Lyme rash because it's got that ulcerating center. It looks, but it does have that ring around it if you look closely. Uh, it has like, it's, it's a clear edge, and that's one of the features of the Lyme rash. It's an expanding rash, so if you get a small rash that's less than uh, like dime size, but it expands, 
that would be a line rash. So I'm going to take questions at the end, but... Uh, yeah, no, could you speak a little louder or hold the mic up closer? Okay, people? is anybody else having trouble hearing me? Yeah. Oh, I'm very sorry. Okay, yeah, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. Thank you. Um, I can hear myself. <laughs> um, but oftentimes the rash looks like a, a just a red rash. It doesn't have any central clearing. It doesn't look like a bullseye, and it expands in size. Bad news, that the Borrelia persist. Now lots of different animal models have shown, so lots of research has gone on all around the world showing that the spirochetes can persist in the hamster, in the mouse, in the beagle dog, in the uh, monkey model, even after antibiotic treatment. Now, Academics largely didn't believe that until the last five years when a study came out of University of California, Davis, <coughs> where one of the most preeminent researchers in the world on Lyme disease, an animal researcher named Stephen Bartol, was doing a study with mice, who he, he infected these mice with the Lyme spirochete, treated them with antibiotics, and then, then starts, look, can I find remnant spirochetes. Can I find persistent spirochetes? So they did blood tests, couldn't find it. They did tissue specimens, couldn't find it. So he was about to conclude that there's no evidence of Borrelia spirochete persistence after antibiotic treatment until he remembered that there's one other technique he should try if he wants to be completely thorough. And so that technique was called the xenodiagnosis technique where you take, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but it's basically you take a tick that you know is not infected and you let it feed on the mouse that had been treated. And the tick, if sometimes, perhaps, will be able to find the spirochete when the human can't. So here's a case where the, where the tick is smarter than the human. Um, and so they start to do this on the mice and on the monkeys, and lo and behold, when they test the belly of the tick for the spirochete, they're able to detect it by the DNA presence, the genetic presence of the spirochete, and sometimes they can actually see the spirochetes as well. So that was done at one of the most preeminent research labs in the country, and then replicated by other labs, not just in the United States, but also in Finland and other places. So what does that mean? Is that good news or bad news? Yeah. Bad news, right. It's bad news because we don't want the spirochete to persist. We don't want the spirochete to evade the antibiotics, right? We don't want that. The good news about this, if you see in the middle, it says often with minimal or no disease. So maybe some of these persistent spirochetes aren't as active as the originally infecting Bugs. And that seems to be true, that they're not quite as active. Okay, so here are the articles that show the Borrelia persist. And actually, way back at Cornell, as Dr. Straubinger in 2000 documented this in dogs, but his finding was so revolutionary, so outrageously new, that people really didn't want to believe it. So it wasn't until the last few years that others started to replicate his work, and now they recognize that he was the first to really show it well in the dog model. So here's an example where you have the, the um, tick feeding on the abdomen of this, uh, or on the arm of this human, and that's the xenodiagnosis method. And now somebody had the great idea. This is where I think the science is exciting because somebody had the great idea, well, if they could do this in mice, why don't we do this with humans? Well, I would never think of doing such a thing. Um, I wouldn't know how to do it anyway. How do you get these ticks that have, how do you know if a tick hasn't been previously infected? Well, the key is you get a larval tick, the youngest, youngest, youngest stage tick, and there, there it is, that little tiny little thing there is a larval tick. No, there's the, yeah, there's the larva, there's the nymph, then the nymph and, and um, bites and the adult's bites. But then they wanted to know, well, can we get the larval that's not yet infected and put it on some 
nice Lyme volunteers. So people have had Lyme disease, and then would the people come? Who would want to be bitten by a tick? And so, so, but they did. So patients volunteered for this study. And so the first report, uh, I'm glad this, this talk was canceled because the, the first report came out after the, the previous talk was scheduled. Um, and the first report showed that one of nine persons with post-treatment Lyme syndrome tested positive, the tick tested positive by uh, PCR, which looks for the DNA of the organism. So that, that was a, uh, a report basically saying that we could do this, that this uh, method of studying persistent Lyme spirochetes in humans works, but also showing that one of the nine spirochetes actually, one of the nine ticks actually did test positive. So that's proof of concept at least that uh, maybe, and this is a maybe, maybe the Borrelia per, uh, spirochete does persist in the human. I'm saying it's a maybe because it could be that even though this individual was previously treated, maybe he got reinfected. Maybe he got bitten by a tick after he got treated, so who knows. Um, but anyway, the study is ongoing. If you have Lyme disease that's well documented, that's been previously treated, or and you want to participate in the study, Lyndon Yu at Tufts is doing it, and Adriana Marquez at the NIH is doing it. I think it's a very important study. Now, just because the spirochete is there doesn't mean it's causing disease. I mean, the goal is not to wipe out all the bugs in our bodies because we have 10 times more microbes in our human body than we have cells, human cells. So if we wiped out all the microbes, we'd be dead. Um, so the goal is not to kill everything, but the goal is to get our bodies into a right balance. And the goal is also to find out, are those persistent spirochetes causing any disease. And in the animal models, if you look, you don't see a whole lot of inflammation. In the, the, the monkey model, there was some suggestion of, of inflammation, but it's not entirely clear. Now this person, Dr. Hudzik from UC Davis, uh, just reported in January about a study he did, because he wanted to look at, are these spirochetes that are still there in the mice causing any trouble? So he looked for inflammation, no inflammation. So then he looked, well, he had a really, they're really smart over there. So what they did was they looked to see, is there any evidence that the tissue around the spirochete is producing immune chemicals to fight? And lo and behold, they did find that the tissues around the spirochete are producing what are called cytokines that help to fight uh, infection. So it, it does raise the reasonable possibility that even though the spirochete is less robust, is not as strong as the original infecting spirochete, it still may be contributing to some symptoms. So it's possible that that may be contributing to, and what, does, what, do, what kind of symptoms do cytokines cause? They can cause fatigue, they can cause muscle pain, they can cause foggy brain, um, so a lot of the symptoms that people experience when they're sick with the flu or sick with uh, Lyme disease uh, that's already been treated uh, might be caused by a small amount of increased cytokine that's flowing around, floating around in your system causing you to feel sick. And it may be because there's just a lousy little spirochete there or not. We don't know, but that's an area of scientific investigation. So why is this good news? It's good news because finally we have animal models in which we can study what the patient community has been telling the academics for so long that the academics have, have ignored. We have a human way of studying it as well, which might be very positive. We have enormously wonderful biotechnological advances that allow us to look at messenger RNA and other things that tell us what's actually going on in these tissues. So it's an exciting time for science and it offers a great deal of promise that you guys will be getting more help in the next five years than you've perhaps had in the last uh, 10 or 15. So here's some pictures of the spirochete. There's a, a mouse that was, or this is a tick that fed upon a mouse on the left. Uh, this is a spirochete that had been treated with salt water, hadn't been treated with antibiotics, and there's 
a spirochete that have, uh, from a mouse that had actually received antibiotics. I, I'm going to skip this so I don't get too, <coughs> too technical. Um, but here's more pictures of the spirochetes in the mice where the arrows are. And this is just the fingerprint of the cytokines. So on the left here, you see the, the uh, fingerprint of the cytokines in the, in the mouse that not, did not get, had been infected with the Lyme spirochete but did not get treated with antibiotics. And this is the one that did get treated with antibiotics. A lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, just as you see. But this only emerged 12 months later, so it might take a while for the resurgence to occur. I don't want you guys to get all depressed on me. Um, so I'm trying to excite you by the fact that the science is allowing us to study things that previously couldn't be studied. Now what's new on the treatment front? I can tell you that really is bad news on the treatment front, is that there, there really is bad news. It's like three studies were done, or four studies, controlled studies, nothing else since. The last study was the one I did, which was finished in 2007. So there's nothing going on right now in terms of controlled studies. The NIH is not interested in controlled studies. I look, at, I look at my data, and I look at other people's data, and I don't know what, you, what your eyeballs show you, but this is what I see. Here I see the Stony Brook study showed more than 60% patients benefited from repeated antibiotic treatment. Those who got placebo, less than 20% benefited. My study showed that over 60% benefited from repeated antibiotics on fatigue, 25% on placebo. Does that look different to you? Does it look like you do better if you get antibiotics? <laughs> Yeah, right? You have a greater chance of improvement. That's what I conclude, but it's not consistent. It's not what others conclude because one of the big studies, the biggest of the studies, which was a well-designed study, did not show improvement. So I think that um, the studies you know, raised questions, um, but there hasn't been anything new since. So that can be difficult. But the good news is that people the scientific community, the academic community, is very well aware now that there are a lot of people who have persistent symptoms. And the question is, why do they have persistent symptoms? The mouse and animal models suggest that maybe some of those patients have persistent infection. But we all know that there are a lot of people out there who have gotten lots of antibiotics and still aren't better. Or they get better briefly and then they relapse. So the question is, what's going on? And what are the antibiotics doing? Are there other treatments that we could be trying that would be more effective and could it be that some of those patients no longer have persistent infection, but maybe they have an immune dysregulation that was triggered by the prior infection? So if you get uh, the flu, if you get a virus, a really horrific flu, you could feel bad for like a year, a year and a half with very similar to symptoms to what you see uh, with Lyme disease. So there's a lot of interest in exploring these questions so we can try to understand better what's going on. Because as I said, the cytokines can cause the same symptoms. And they can be triggered either by persistent spirochete or by an ongoing immune dysregulation that was triggered by the previous Lyme disease. And this is something that really bothers me. I don't know if you know it, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, and as a psychiatrist, I um, find it very troubling about so many people suffer with psychiatric symptoms who have had Lyme disease. So about 40% of the patients with <coughs> previously treated Lyme disease who are still symptomatic, about 40% of them have substantial depression. Um, and why is that? It could be because they have persistent pain. It could be because they can't think as clearly. And it could also be because the initial infection caused changes in the central nervous system neurotransmitters, and that once those changes occur, you can't fix it with antibiotics anymore. And that maybe you need another approach, such as a psychiatric one. So I think it's a huge mistake that patients make uh, to avoid psychiatric care. I understand why they do that, because they've been told Numerous times you're making it up, it's all in your head, there's nothing wrong with you. And so the last thing they want to do is go see a mental health professional because that will maybe confirm what everybody's been thinking about them all along. But what I want to convey is that depression 
and neuropsychiatric changes, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, hyperirritability, that's part of the syndrome that's induced by the Lyme disease. And just like you would do with any other part of your body to try to get it better, you need to use all the modalities if you are gonna get better. And we recently looked to see among the patients with post-treatment Lyme disease who come see us, how many have suicidal thoughts? And it's about 20%. And we then looked at a group of HIV patients, patients who have been diagnosed with AIDS, uh, AIDS infection. And it was, they had about 25% had suicidal thoughts. So obviously, Lyme disease is a really serious problem that's very troubling to patients. Um, and it's a huge mistake not to get the treatment that, they, that you might be able to get. Okay, so is there any evidence that patients with persistent symptoms have a heightened immune response? I'm sorry for so much science, but it's your fault mm -hmm. because you came here to a talk called Science Bridges the Gap. So it's your fault. Um, <laughs> so what did we learn? Well, we've learned some incredibly interesting thing, things. So from the study that I did, uh, we saved, saved serum in a freezer, and then we had this wonderful immunologist look at it, and what he was able to find was that the patients with persistent Lyme symptoms that have been previously treated, many of them have elevated antibodies against nerve tissue, comparable to what you see with lupus, suggesting that there's maybe an autoimmune or a, pers or a persistent infection triggering these antibodies to continue. So that's interesting. Another study also from our group showed that persistent symptoms are associated with a higher expression of the interferon gamma genes. And this was also published by Dr. Aladini. Interferon gamma is a cytokine, and as I said, it can cause the same symptoms. So here we have an elevated expression in the serum of patients with previously treated Lyme disease. And isn't that beautiful? This is just a little nice little art, modern art for you, but um, <laughs> What the diagram basically, we did, let me just tell you, forget the diagram, let me just tell you what, what was done. So the spinal fluid was collected. It was sent to this uh, US Department of Energy lab in Washington state. And they have this really sophisticated um, way of doing what's called proteomic analysis, which basically looks at proteins, tiny little amounts, in a very sensitive way. And what was done was, Dr. Schutzer did this. He compared the spinal fluid of Lyme patients to the spinal fluid of healthy patients to the spinal fluid of those with chronic fatigue syndrome. And what do you think was found? What was found was that, the, um, that there are some unique proteins, 700 unique proteins in the Lyme patients that weren't there in the other groups. And similarly, chronic fatigue was uniquely different uh, than the Lyme patients. So that shows that Lyme disease, post-treatment Lyme syndrome is not just chronic fatigue syndrome. So that was important. And then if you look to see what proteins were elevated, there were some of the immune proteins, the complement cascade proteins. And so that's important. So this study is ongoing and we're probing and, and studying this group further. But this may help us to understand better why patients are having these persistent symptoms. And then here was a study that we did looking at uh, brain metabolism abnormalities, and all those yellow red spots are areas of metabolic abnormalities in our Lyme patients. And then we wanted to see, do patients have abnormalities in blood flow? So watch me, look at, look at so we have people lying in this, lying in this um, PET scan, and we, first we do an image of their brain to see how the blood flow is flowing, breathing room air, and then we have them breathe through a snorkel, and the room air is enhanced with carbon dioxide. Now, if you're healthy, if you're healthy, what you should see is that your brain starts like this and it goes like this with the carbon dioxide. And so you have a big increase of blood flow. If you're not healthy, if you have areas of decreased vascular flow, you'll, you won't be able to enhance as much as you should. So we compared the Lyme patients to healthy people, and we found that the Lyme patients had a deficit in the ability to enhance their blood flow. So there's a vascular compromise. So we learned something about that. 
Now here's something really interesting that Dr. Steer has just published, his group, which uh, is showing that there is a marker in the Lyme arthritis patients, which is uh, the endothelial cell growth factor, and that there are these antibodies to endothelial cell growth factor in his chronic Lyme arthritis patients. Now isn't that interesting? What is that? That's, that's what the, the endothelial cell lines the blood vessels. So basically, it could be that the antibodies are attacking the inside of the blood vessels and causing problems with blood flow. So why is this exciting? Because the, what's being seen in the brain imaging, it, it, this may explain why you have those abnormalities in the brain imaging, because of antibodies against the internal lining of the blood vessels. Am I driving you crazy? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, 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 we're gonna take questions at the end and you can ask me whatever questions you want. So it'll be a lot easier, easier for you, I think, once we get to that. But I'm almost, I'm almost done. Now I've always wondered, you know, the standard Lyme tests, how many false positives are there? Because I've often heard that we can't trust the ELISA, you can't trust the IgM Western blot, but you can't trust the IgG Western blot. So I was, I've been after trying to find some good figures. And so Marty Schriefer, who's at the Centers for Disease Control, who runs Lyme Diagnostics, gave me this information last week. And what it showed is that if you have MS, you're likely, it's a good chance you'll have a false positive, an 18% chance of false positive on the ELISA. So the ELISA we know, it's just not that specific. Western blot, a 9% chance. And the IgG does very well in all the different things. Fibromyalgia, interestingly, did very well. No false positives on the ELISA, only 3% on the IgM Western blot. Mono did terribly. So if you have mono or if you're testing someone for mono, they're probably gonna test positive on the ELISA, uh, and they may well test positive on the IgM Western blot. So you'll think you have Lyme, well maybe you don't. <coughs> it's often said that severe gum disease or periodontal disease is, is also a risk factor for false positives. Well, he didn't find that at all in his, in his study. Rheumatoid arthritis, there was a somewhat increased risk. If you have syphilis, which is a spirochete, you have a huge false positive. 85% will test positive on the Lyme test, even though they don't have Lyme. And if you're in a healthy area, 102 people from a healthy non, if you're healthy and from a non-endemic area where they don't have a lot of Lyme disease, there's a, about a 5% false positive rate on the ELISA and the IgM, it's only about 2%. So it's, it was interesting to me, the IgM looks a little bit better than I thought that it would. And that's from the CDC. So here's some good news. Are there any new diagnostic tests? We've had the same old tests over and over again, right? And uh, there are some new, Tests. Uh, the C6 was new about five or seven years ago, and that's, that's a reasonably good ELISA test. It's, there's another one version of that called the VLSE, which is good. There's a combination test now that people are testing, the C6, C10 rapid test. So these are all antibody tests. They don't tell you whether the infection is actually present. They just tell you if your uh, immune system has recognized it. So that's a limitation. There's, I, don't, I won't give you any details on this, but people are doing these things called metabolomics to try to find new diagnostic markers. If you come to our conference in May, you'll hear about one of the national experts on this approach. Um, if you get a lot of science on, if you come to our conference. If you're really turned on by this, you should come to that. Um, um, PCR, there's some much more sensitive ways of doing PCR now. So a recent study done with early Lyme disease showed that they could actually detect it about 65% of the time um, with, a com um, with PCR, which is quite good. Um, culture is, uh, is obviously the best possible test because then you actually know that the organism is there if you can culture it. It's hard to culture. Uh, some labs report a better uh, performance than other labs. Uh, but it also takes many weeks. So it takes a long time no matter who's doing the culture. And then there's a new assay that we're gonna be testing out here in Poughkeepsie. If there's any primary care doctors here who see a lot of patients with Lyme rash, come talk to me, because I'd love to talk to you, because uh, we need collaborators who see early Lyme disease. Uh, but we're looking at something called a spirofine, which um, supposedly, if, it's, if it works, will be able to tell you whether there's active infection or not. 
in a fast uh, in a fast way. What about vaccines? Wouldn't we like to have a vaccine? Would you like? Raise your hand if you would like to have a vaccine. Okay, so there's a lot of people here who would like a vaccine. Okay. Um, well, as you know, the previous vaccine uh, went through a lot of a trial of about 10,000 people, but that ended up being taken off the market um, for lots of reasons. Uh, there's a new version of that um, that Baxter in Europe has put out, um, and they're trying to get into the United States. Um, supposedly, it um, is better than the previous one and uh, less risky. Um, problem with a lot of, the problem with the OSPE vaccines, and it's still going to be a problem with this one, is that you need repeated boosters. You need a booster of like two boosters in the beginning, and then you need another one six months, another one in a year, and so you're constantly going back to the doctor to get these boosters, which is annoying. And the protection, at least in the previous one, was only about 70% protective, so that's not so great either, because you, you think you're protected, and then you don't put on the protections, or you're not careful, and then you get bitten by a tick, so that's not so great. So it wasn't perfect. Rich Marconi, who's gonna, who's gonna be speaking at our conference, is one of the co-chairs of the conference, has developed something called the OSPC chimeric vaccine, which in the animal model appears to be effective against all Borrelia strains. You don't need these boosters. And, um, it, and it also seems to be protective against anaplasma, because they've designed it. So not effective, effective not just against Lyme, but against another co-infection. So that's promising. You guys all know about co-infections? Yeah. Of course you do. Um, and the co-infections are highly problematic. The ticks carry more than Lyme, often. Babesia, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, deer tick virus, Powassan virus, about two or three percent of the ticks carry Powassan virus, which can go, cause a very severe encephalitis, brain infection. And then there's this uh, fascinating new spirochetal organism called Borrelia miyamotoi. You've heard about that, everybody? No? no? Okay, Borrelia miyamotoi is a new organism that was actually identified about 10 years ago, but people didn't know it caused human disease. But uh, in Russia, a couple of years ago, there was a report about how Borrelia miyamotoi caused a very similar disease to Lyme disease in Russia. And then there was another set of reports about a year or so ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, reporting that it can cause a meningoencephalitis, uh, it can cause flu-like symptoms, a very Lyme-like illness without, without, without the rash. Now, you're gonna test negative on the standard Lyme tests. So you'll have Lyme-like symptoms, but you'll test negative on the Lyme tests, but you'll respond to doxycycline treatment. So a lot of the patients out here, in your crowd here, who, whose doctor has treated you for possible Lyme disease, even though the tests have been negative, may have been treating not the agent of Lyme disease, but they may have been treating the agent of Borrelia miyamotoi. Borrelia miyamotoi. So the good news is that it seems to be quite responsive to standard antibiotics that we use for Lyme disease. And this may, I like this story because it basically says, the doctors who said this isn't Lyme disease, you don't have Lyme disease, maybe they were right for many of the patients. And the patients who said, but doc, why don't you treat me anyway and see if I get better? Mm -hmm. uh, they were right too because oftentimes they got better if they were treated with Borrelia miyamotoi. So both the docs and the patients were right, which is always a happier scenario. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to finish with a few slides telling you about studies that we're about to start or, or are doing. We're planning a big brain imaging study of, of uh, pain, persistent pain, because a lot of patients have persistent pain. And we theorize and, uh, that it's actually a central brain circuitry that's hyperactive. And we have ideas on how to modify that. So this is going to be a free study. Uh, when it gets approved. So I imagine it will be functioning probably, uh, it will probably start up in July. And so we have a meditation study which is starting up in Connecticut, in, um, in, in uh, Southport, Connecticut, which is right near Fairfield. It's done by Dr. Chip Alexander, who's a wonderful uh, meditation, kundalini meditation uh, uh, expert. And that's going to be an eight-week group therapy. So if you have well-documented prior Lyme disease and you want to participate in the study, go to our website and get more information about it. Um, 
We're going to start a new cognitive study, so you'll get free neuroscience testing. So if you're interested in getting that, you can you can look there. And then we have the uh, the Spirofine, the Lyme uh, new diagnostic uh, study that we're doing. Um, uh, so here's a little ad for the conference, May 3rd and 4th in Providence. Uh, you'll hear Dr. Yu from Tufts talking about that study in humans where you put ticks on the humans. You'll hear Dr. Forrester from the CDC talk about the tragic case of people who have died from uh, Lyme carditis. Um, you'll hear an expert talking about the Watson virus, an expert at Columbia who's a, who's a suicide expert talking about what we know about suicide, what we know about Lyme disease. Um, and then Dr. Younger from NYU will be talking about uh, gamma globulin therapy. And gamma globulin therapy is very interesting. That's, that's an immune modulating therapy which is used for people who have autoimmune neuropathies and other autoimmune diseases. It's fascinating because if you have a hyperactive immune response and you give someone IVIG, it'll help normalize it and quiet down. If you have a deficient amount of IVIGs, it'll raise you. So it actually is, has sort of a normalizing function. And um, it definitely can help people with autoimmune neuropathies. And I have seen some patients make quite a bit of improvement clinically. Now it needs to be studied in a, in a controlled way, but I, th but I think this is a pretty interesting new, tr new treatment for some of our Lyme patients. So I thank Jill Auerbach for this, uh, which she just sent me yesterday. And here's uh, Noah's Ark. And uh, wait, the ticks, we forgot the ticks. And you know, uh, it's too bad, they, too bad they brought the ticks back onto the boat. Um, but it also emphasizes the point that we shouldn't forget that the problem really is the ticks. And if we could do something to control the ticks better, uh, we would be a lot better off. Wait a minute, the last slide, let me go back. Oh, forget it, okay. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> so the question is, uh, can I donate blood if I've previously had uh, Lyme disease? And I think the answer is no. Um, and I, I, I believe that they're also screening the blood for Babesia, because Babesia can cause a huge problem if, if someone is immunosuppressed. Joe? Brian, I have yeah. no way currently to screen the blood Bob for the babesiosis, but if you've ever had babesiosis, then you should never donate blood. Um, the problem is that with healthy young people, they can get babesiosis just as many of us who walk around being, being carrying um, bacteria in our body and don't get sick from it. Young, healthy people who don't necessarily get sick from babesia, they go in and they donate blood, and then, um, People who are in the hospital, et cetera, are transfused with blood and have even died. Right, so it's a huge, it's a huge risk for patients. And the red cross does not mess with it. The xenodiagnostic research that's done seems that it assumes that the babesiosis is caused by the bacteria that is transmitted um, It can, it actually can go from the nymphal up to the nymph. It can go from the larval to the nymph. It can. It's called transstadial transmission. It can do that. But from, I guess, the, so from the, from the last phase of adult to the first phase, can it or can it not transmit? Oh, I mean, the larval, the larval ticks would not be, in, the nymphal ticks, the larval ticks would not be infected. Borrelia miyamotoi. Excuse me. Borrelia miyamotoi. Borrelia miyamotoi is a different story, actually. Uh, and. I believe the uh, larval ticks do this actually this um, hold Borrelia miyamotoi. This corner. Much of what you're talking about is associated with Isoia scapularis, the deer tick. Do you have any reason why that deer tick seems to be the, the real culprit in a lot of these things? And isn't that tick sort of native to the southeast and not necessarily <laughs> native to the northeast? On this. Um, Exodia scapularis is primarily up here. It's primarily in the northwest and the upper upper Midwest. And uh, I believe it is now, but I mean, most of the people who have lived in this area in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, they never saw deer ticks. We saw the dog tick. 
We saw, you know, some of the other ticks, but the deer ticks seem to move up the valley in yeah. the last 15, 20 yeah, the years. Ticks, yeah, the ticks are actually also carried by birds, right? Sure. So at the sure. bird migration routes up the Hudson River, is, is spreading a lot of a lot of the. But the deer tick seems to be the number one culprit, though. That's yeah. So we call it we call it deer ticks, but you know most of the, the ticks are really on the mice and the, the deer. Sure, you know, sure. yeah. But I mean the dog tick isn't giving you. That's right. It's not the dog tick. Yeah, I don't know why it's the exotic scapularis tick. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of um, there have certainly been uh, studies done, uh, especially in Europe, but also here in the United States showing that patients who get early neurologic Lyme disease can have white matter lesions. And those white matter lesions sometimes can be quite large and sometimes can be hard to disting distinguish from MS. So there are a group of patients for whom sometimes it's unclear. Do they have MS or do they have Lyme or do they have both? Uh, and so oftentimes the neurologist, uh, aware that it's not easy to make that discernment, will treat <coughs> with intravenous antibiotics for the possibility of Lyme disease if there's other evidence to support the Lyme disease uh, in case it might be helpful. So there are some papers on that. The NIH has done some work in that area. And in Europe, actually, the agents of uh, one of the one of the geno species there that causes Lyme disease causes a really dramatic, uh, very inflammatory neurologic Lyme disease in which there are a lot of patients there who uh, have MS-like symptoms. Um, interesting question. So the question is: I've received IVIG for ten years, and can you receive it for too long? Um, certainly, people who need IVIG, uh, and there are a lot of patients who do, uh, with other for other reasons. Uh, they get it for years. Um, and so I'm not an expert on IVIG, so I can't answer your question, but I certainly know that people can be on for many years. Yeah. Central, there's this whole central, what's called central sensitization hypothesis, uh, which is that the brain neural pathways get hypersensitized, and it's, the, it's part of the pain pathway network. And those pain pathways are no longer responsive to opiates, for example. So if you treat someone with opiates, that's not gonna go away. They'll still have the sensory sensitization. If, uh, so you need um, neurotransmitter modulators that will help reduce the central sensitization. So many of those modulators are being studied, but among them would be the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like duloxetine and uh, Effexor, Cymbalta. Uh, gabapentin, which is Neurontin, uh, Lyrica, which is pregabalin, and then uh, there's... Are there natural supplements? There may be, but I, I, I'm not that familiar with them. There's also an interest in ketamine. Ketamine is a very interesting, and we're going to have someone talk about ketamine a bit at our conference. Ketamine is, um, works on the glutamate neurotransmitter, um, and we need agents that work on the glutamate system. Um, and actually, ketamine is actually a very powerful medication for patients with refractory depression, severe depressions that haven't responded to other things. And there's evidence that can also help to improve pain. I'm coming from, from, from this in, in your opinion, this is to put you on the spot, um, what do you think is the efficacy of hyperbaric treatment medicine with neurological complications? Um, I, you know, I, I can't really answer that question. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that it's been studied in any kind of systematic way. I mean, I do, the only thing I remember about hyperbaric, I've seen patients who've gotten better with hyperbaric oxygen. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is used for patients who have uh, deep tissue infections where the blood flow is really poor and uh, for infections that, that don't do well under high oxygen. Uh, circumstances. Um, there was one study that was once presented at a conference uh, by someone at New York Medical College, and the study was a very cool study of hyperbaric oxygen in the mouse model. So they cre created a little hyperbaric chamber for the mouse, and in fact, these guys are clever, right? Uh, and um, Chuck Paviat did this study, and 
He then infected the mice with Borrelia spirochetes, the mouse got, let's say, arthritis. And uh, then he had one group of mice that didn't get hyperbaric oxygen, another group of mice that did. And lo and behold, the mice that did get the hyperbaric oxygen had a much lower uh, density of spirochetes after the hyperbaric oxygen than before. So the hyperbaric oxygen clearly was decreasing the, um, maybe killing off some of the spirochetes and certainly decreasing the load. However, uh, after time, the volume started to increase again. So after six months, there wasn't any difference. So it seemed to have a suppressive effect on the infection initially that didn't actually last. So the question is, are the infectious disease doctors more open to dialogue than they had been in the past? Um, and I will have to say, just like um, any other huge organization, the Infectious Disease Society of America is large, right? It's huge. And there are those in there who have, are open-minded, and there are those in there who are closed-minded. And I think that the new research is forcing people to change their views, and those who aren't changing their views are really getting cornered. Um, so I think that's where I think the science is exciting, because well, it's supporting change of opinion. So the question is, if you have had the previous vaccine, what's a good test? And I think the, I think the Lyme C6 ELISA is, uh, is inexpensive, and it gives you a lot of, if it's positive, uh, I mean, it shouldn't be positive if you had the Lyme-Rix vaccine. The Western blot theoretically shouldn't be positive if you've had the Lyme-Rix vaccine, but uh, this Certainly stories I've heard about patients having a uh, pretty robust Western blot response, even, even with the Lyme-Rex vaccine. Um, so you commented that I'm a psychiatrist, yeah. and you commented on uh, psychosomatic symptoms. Yeah, and the medications that you're and using. The medications that people normally use for those. Yeah. Is there any counteraction towards Lyme disease in, in that? That will counteract Does it actually fight the spirochete? Is that the question? Which, which maybe Lyme disease caused some of these, but it, the drugs that you use for your patients for, for depression or whatever it is, are they, is there any counteraction? Well, I mean, there are multiple modes of, of action that all medicines have. So, for example, the medicines that psychiatrists use tend to have uh, lots of actions on the neurotransmitters, right? Changing glutamate or norepinephrine or serotonin. But... Some of the medicines actually were originally um, antibiotics. So, for example, one of the medicines that we're going to be looking at is uh, decycloserine, which is a tuberculosis drug. It also happens to be a very powerful modulator of glutamate. Um, so there are a lot of, some, some medicines have other modalities of action. Um, what I was suggesting in my talk is that the Lyme infection causes changes in the neurotransmitters, right? And I have to prove, I have to prove this, I haven't proven it, but that's my suspicion. And that, at least in a subgroup of patients, you need the psychiatric neurotransmitter modulation treatment to bring the person back to a state of health. Well, I'm not an antibiotic expert, so I just was, I, 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 I want you to know that, but it's a very reasonable practice if one antibiotic is no longer working, which is what ID docs do all the time, to switch to another antibiotic. And there are a number of different antibiotics that work against Borrelia. You may have co-infections, so you may want to make sure that you're being treated for those as well. Um, that's a great question, and diffusion tensor imaging allows you to look at the actually tr white matter tracks in a very sensitive way, um, and the answer is not yet. I do know that there's a group in I do know there's a group in Norway that's that's doing a study now with DTI. The study that we're proposing will be including diffusion tensor imaging, but I don't know of any yet. The Lyme infection is not always the same infection, so. The Borrelia spirochete has multiple different strains. So it's very likely that the strain that infected you later on that may have caused the arthritis was, had some variants that made it different from the strains that caused the rash. Why is it that sometimes people don't get a rash at all? 
Maybe this is a strain variation. So one of another bit of the exciting things about science right now is that there are studies looking at that. So there's a study at Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins, in which they're taking patients at the presentation of the rash, uh, and then they're actually identifying the strain of spirochete in the blood by PCR. And then you can look to see, well, people who go on to get chronic symptoms, are they infected with one strain versus another strain? Some people are more likely to get recurrent rashes or arthritis or not. So that's a variance. Another, another possibility is that someone who's been previously infected numerous times, maybe it primes the body in a certain way. So that your body is not the same as it was five years ago. And that may be a part of it. <coughs> Uh, ten years ago, uh, I, I had mine like a lot of people in this room did, and were very, very encouraged at the good news you're offering us. A lot of people here are upset about mine, but the majority of these people are upset about how the medical insurance and so forth have cheated them when they had mine. That's what these people are really upset about, like me. Now, uh, we hope that they're going to change a little bit, but I, I have a test that would uh, see if the medical industry and the insurance industry have changed a bit. And this is to find out if, if, if a doctor gives uh, uh, several treatments of antibiotics and the local medical society excludes them and the insurance company includes them, and, and they try to kill this guy and get him to hell out of the business. And that, that's a test that could, someone here ought to find out whether there's anything changed from what it was 10 years ago to what it is today, due to your good work. Well, it's not my good work. It's uh, a, lot of people's, a lot of people are contributing to the science, but you're raising a really troubling point, which is that doctors who are treating patients with persistent symptoms um, often will give a repeated course of antibiotics and sometimes they will be targeted by insurance companies and taken off panels or criticized by medical societies and I am hoping that the good news of the science will protect those doctors uh, because right now at the very least we need to be humble about how little we know. Uh, we know a lot more than we did before, but we certainly know that what we thought was definitely true before is not necessarily true. And hopefully people will recognize that. But, uh, the first question was about research on heavy metals and Borrelia persistence. Uh, I, I do recall in articles, but I don't recall anything about it. So unfortunately, I'm not an expert in that area, so I can't speak. There are people who know a lot more about that than I do. Um, second question was what again? It was. Oh yeah, right. The problem of only studying people who have well-documented Lyme disease. So the good thing about studying people who only have well-documented Lyme disease is that you know for sure what you're studying. The bad part is that there are a lot of people out there who have persistent symptoms that may well be due to something like Lyme disease, maybe Borrelia miyamotoi. Once we have a test for that, you might test positive for that. Um, but that's been a huge limitation. And the research studies is that they focus, I mean, it's both a strength and a limitation. I think the more homogeneous, the better you'll, more you'll learn from that subgroup. But it's such a defined, narrow subgroup that you don't learn about all the other people. Yes, doctors sometimes are uh, wary of testing for Lyme disease unless there's a classic manifestation, unless you see, come in with the, uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't even need to test when you come in with a clear Lyme rash, because you know the person has yeah. most of the time. But Doctors are wary, and why are they wary? Because they're worried because if you get a positive test, then what do you do? Because uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, the positive test doesn't necessarily mean you've got active infection now, it could mean you had it before. On the other hand, it provides the doctor with information that he should have and should be willing to work with. I think it's a mistake not to test if there's a reason that's good to test, like someone who's got one persistent symptoms. One last question, please. If you have asked before, just one last question. Yeah. My, my question is the uh, CDC standards on the uh, Western blot test. I uh, got a test through Quest Diagnostics, came up negative, and I had all the symptoms with arthritis and everything. So we went and I had to pay out of pocket, of course, 
to get it done by a Lyme specialty lab, and it was off the chart positive. But the CDC doesn't recognize two very important bands that are related to the Lyme causing bacteria. So my question is, I guess, um, since there's all this body of evidence <coughs> developing, um, what is it going to take to get the CDC to recognize the aggressive antibiotic treatments, the proper testing? Because I, like probably half the people in here, fight with my insurance company. And something changed this year at the same company, the same policy, but now they're not paying for my antibiotics long term. Um, so who do you have to get to? Who, who's going to, what's going to drive this? I know it's politics, it's medical politics, but it, at me as an individual, who can I well, I think, you know, I think what drives it is, is uh, um, the science, but not always the science, the science supported by an, an, an active patient community who are talking to their legislators and, and teaching them about the science, teaching them about what we know. So the we fact that, the, the, fact that disease, yeah, right? the fact that this disease is spreading so widely, prevalence is increasing, uh, means that there are going to be more and more people in positions of power who are get, you know, have relatives or they themselves get it, and that will drive action. It certainly but has in many you states. Think before the light bulb goes off and, and there's more recognition of the aggressive treatments and the proper testing. I mean, I've tr look, I've tried, I've tried, and I have research to make my point, and some people are persuaded and others aren't. And um, I, I don't know why I can't persuade people. I think they're reasonable people. I think that they're smart people. But two more questions. So, my Amotoy. Uh, Borrelia, you don't, you won't know you have it, but but if you let's say you suddenly get flu-like symptoms, maybe a high fever, uh, muscle pains, the, you know, the typical Lyme flu-like symptoms. Um, and you test negative for Lyme disease, let's say, but you definitely were in a Lyme endemic area and probably got bitten by a tick. If you saw the tick, that's even better. And you can't know for sure that it's Borrelia miyamotoi right now because we don't have that test. Although the test does exist, Immugen in Massachusetts uh, has it, and I'm sure they're going for FDA approval, and that probably will be pushed through fast. Uh, so my guess is that within the next six months, we'll have a test for it. Mm -hmm. no, no problem. One question, please. Jill has a last question. Okay, so uh, I, yeah. just, I just want to tell people, number one, we have brochures out on the table there for the conference that uh, Dr. Fallon is involved with, and it is fabulous and just full of science. So if that's your thing, go for it. That's number one. Number two, Dr. Horowitz has written a book that, and he's here in the audience, that explains his theory, which is that it's a multiple systemic disorder, and that's why some people get better and some people don't. So it may not just be Lyme disease, it may be heavy metals and many other things, and there's a little bit of information out there on that. There's also a lot of information out there from the Lyme Disease Association that's really wonderful. And last but not least, I have to say, we're all different. What you're infected with or what you're infected with and how my immune system treats it and how your immune system, we're all different. So it's a very complex situation and truthfully, um, I do not believe in a Lyme vaccine because just here in Dutchess County, um, 10 years ago, Dr. Osfeld tested the ticks and they were about 2% infected with babesiosis, which is a parasitic disease like malaria. And now it's way over 17% on average in Dutchess County. So if you get treated for uh, a vaccine that doesn't even hold up beyond one year, you're gonna have a full sense of security, you're gonna go out, not protect yourself necessarily, and you're gonna get nabbed by something else. And believe me, that happened to me because I was being treated for Lyme disease, thought um, this was long before you the babesiosis, I went out in my garden, and I got nabbed with that BC 105 fevers. I'm lucky I was alive afterwards. So that is not the answer. The answer is the problem is in the environment, and we have got to get our federal and state uh, legislators to say we want 
tick control research studies. That's the most promising field and has received a piece of funding. Thank you, dear. Uh, I'm on that now.